Welcome to the uh, continuation of the Saga City Music Conference. My name is Phil Vassell and um, I'm the moderator of this uh, panel. Uh, we have our esteemed guests here to um, help us wade through uh, the panel, which is titled Overcoming Challenges as a BIPOC Artist. And um, our excellent panel consists of, um, to my left, um, we'll start with uh, Bushra Janaid of the Ontario Arts Council. And um, she's been with the Arts Council for about 14 years and um, someone you must get to know um, as she's uh, a funder there. And we also have um, uh, David Click Cox, who has worn a lot of hats in the entertainment industry. Um, he's worked at the big labels. He's worked as a consultant. He teaches and uh, he runs his own company, Click Creative. And then we have um, Demetrius Nath, who also runs his own company. And um, he's also, I, I believe the name of his company is Anti... Skeptic. Anti Skeptic. I want to make sure that I get get the right words there. Um, and he's also um, in charge of Mississauga Music, which is a nonprofit organization. And uh, we also have with us um, Courtney Uno, who's someone I've known for many, many years. He's worked um, as a manager, a uh, person who's been involved in the music industry for probably over 20 years. Um, as my guest and has worked with a variety of artists, um, some of whom are household names that um, you will get to know as we get further into the conversation. Um, but before we go further into this, I wanted to um, give a special thank you to our two um, primary sponsors, Factor and um, the Department of Canadian Heritage and also the Irie Music Festival, um, all of which has made this possible. And uh, we really do appreciate um, the opportunity to talk um, you know, about this challenge. And I say talk about this challenge because you know, like everyone here, we know that um, the global pandemic uh, George Floyd's killing the BLM protests of last summer, which was considered, you know, the largest civil rights protest ever, um, has put the topic of racial equity, diversity, and inclusion on the table. And um, of course, we know the once in a hundred year pandemic has also been a major issue. So there's lots to chew on in terms of how we navigate this space. And, um, you know, it's easy to talk about, you know, what is wrong today, but um, I don't want to minimize that. I also want to talk about, you know, some of the um, solutions that we can look at to uh, make the situation much better than it appears to be. So I thought that I would um, speak first with uh, Bushra who, um, you know, as a, as a person at the forefront of um, Ontario Arts Council um, for over 14 years now, uh, she's seen a lot and um, is in a position to share with us what some of the things that we can do um, to um, improve our opportunities, to improve our chances you know, to talk about examples of people who have benefited from working with Ontario Arts Council. So at this point, Bushra, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you. And uh, then we go to uh, uh, David and uh, then to um, Demetrius and then finally to um, Courtney as well. So without any further ado, I don't have a drum roll, but imagine there's a drum roll, please. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Bushra from the Ontario Arts Council. Thank you, Phil, and thank you for inviting me to participate today and uh, happy to be amongst this uh, fine crew. 
of music industry uh, experts. So I'm uh, Bushra Junaid. I'm an artist, I'm a curator, and I'm arts manager of Nigerian and Jamaican ancestry raised in St. John's, Newfoundland. And I would like to, to start situate myself before I begin to speak. So my Caribbean ancestors were forcibly brought to this part of the world. And as somebody, uh, as an unsettled person on stolen and unceded land, I recognize the different but intersecting ways that colonialism has had an impact on Black and Indigenous people and people of color. And I recognize that our liberation struggles are intertwined and that fostering relationships of allyship, trust, and mutual care amongst us will build solidarity, equity, and justice for all. I'd also like to acknowledge the diversity of the first people of the area that I live and work in, uh, known as Takaronto, and honor the stewardship of the Horan Windat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. So uh, today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I am grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Uh, I'm also the Ontario Arts Council's Outreach and Development Manager, and I'm the officer who manages the Skills and Career Development Indigenous Arts Professionals and Arts Professionals of Colour program, as well as programs for deaf artists and artists with disabilities. Uh, the Skills and Career Development program supports professional development and skill building opportunities for Indigenous and Black arts professionals and arts professionals of colour through study or training, mentorship, internships or apprenticeships, and documentation of existing artwork. And I'm gonna paste the, a link to the program webpage in the chat and I encourage everyone to read up on it. The program is currently open for applications and there's a deadline on uh, May the 1st at 1 p.m. So I really encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, the Ontario Arts Council is currently embarked on a, uh, embarking on a strategic planning process to kind of guide our work over the next five years. And this new plan is gonna build on the existing um, vision and strategies. And it's uh, really will um, hopefully reconfirm support for existing priority groups. And they are indigenous artists, artists of color, francophone artists, new generation artists, so artists who are 18 to 30 years of age, regional artists, so anybody outside of the M postal code or 416, uh, are considered regional artists and uh, deaf artists and artists with disabilities. Uh, lots of things have changed since we launched our last plan six years ago, including many of the issues that Phil has raised. So the pandemic, BLM and movements for racial equity and social justice and urgency around the state of our environments. So the um, the work that we undertake and, and have with artists across the province through the strategic planning process is gonna really help us uh, develop our vision going forward. So I really encourage um, anyone who's interested to um, participate in that process through the surveys and other um, stakeholder groups and things like that work that we're gonna hold. Um, but as the province went into the first lockdown um, earlier last year, Ontario Arts Council responded in a number of ways. Uh, first, we consulted with the arts community and listened to suggestions and developed an arts response initiative. And in order to do this, we had to move money from a number of programs that uh, weren't really practical or safe during the pandemic. So those included like fellowship and touring and market development grants. And um, this was one-time support to individuals, groups, and arts organizations to explore and develop new ways of working during the pandemic. So Indigenous Black uh, or an artists of color as well as deaf artists and artists with disabilities were given particularly consider particular consideration and almost half of the applications were from, from folks from those communities. Uh, we received over 250 applications from musicians uh, to the individual stream and funded about 84 or or 33% of those applications. Musicians were funded from across the province, including as far away as Attawapiskat in the far north. 
And some of the challenges or issues identified in applications included a lack of access to collaborators, such as engineers or produce other producers to help folks uh, through the recording process, uh, requests to set up uh, one's own recording studio or pr purchase software, learn how to self-produce or engineer, uh, training and mentorship to learn how to take control over more phases of one's practice uh, than, than people had uh, traditionally. Uh, there were, um, as I mentioned, requests for software to upgrade equipment, including like purchasing quality microphones and um, such and learning how to market oneself. Um, hiring marketing consultants to promote your practice or to take courses to, courses to learn about social media strategies to promote oneself. So those were some of the examples. Um, people also did things like upgrading their studios, so soundproofing or permanently uh, creating a space in their home, uh, buying high quality microphones, reaching out to consultants or technicians over Zoom to help them to kind of you know, develop <laughs> or set up these, this, these new ways of working. Um, basically all things to give artists long-term stability and to really transform their practice going forward or to allow them to carry on their practice in a different way uh, over a longer period of time. So hopefully some of the things that were supported through this will also help to push the organization to think about you know, being more flexible around um, capital costs and things like that. Um, I don't sure if you want me to keep going, <laughs> Phil, uh, Phil, and then, um, which I, ca I can do, or to make space for others to speak now. Well, I think what, we, um, <clears throat> what we're hoping um, to do is at some point we're going to open this up for some questions. And um, I know that any one of you guys could probably speak for an hour based on your experiences. So we're hoping that... Um, you know, each panelist takes about 10 minutes. Okay, so I'll just keep going for a little bit and then I'll, yeah. I'll uh, so I just wanted to, um, to, I started out mentioning the skills and career development program and I do want to speak a little bit about that and give you some examples of some of the activity that's been supported um, so that people have a, and some ideas about uh, what they themselves might do. So um, for example, I'm thinking about, uh, I mentioned there's four categories to this. Uh, I think I mentioned that there are four categories to this particular grant. So things like study or training, it might be to take uh, courses, workshops, master classes, uh, things like mentorship with more established um, artists or arts professionals or people in any field. Um, it may be an internship with an organization. Um, so I'm gonna give you some examples of, of things. So, um, you know, an emerging music presenter who wanted to um, present music that showed links or, um, or binds uh, that connect, historically connect black uh, music across genres. So Afrobeat, music, jazz, blues, jazz, rumba, reggae, hip hop, they were supported to do a mentorship with a renowned uh, New York based music industry veteran. Um, to, uh, who's sort of a, a major player in black music networks in North America. Um, you know, somebody funded to develop their skills as a hip hop and Afro beat artist by refining their singing, audio recording and documenting their work. Uh, mentorship with um, a, sound, a sound artist go, uh, doing a mentorship in Berlin. Uh, to look at, to learn more about distinctive sound systems and building sound installations and special recording techniques and, you know, hidden environmental sounds, that kind of thing. One-on-one uh, -on -one training in Ableton, you know, music software, um, um, professional development, like one-on-one -on -one sessions with um, international um, you know, to, to attend international conferences, music industry meetings, um, training in music management. Uh, I'm thinking of a tabla, uh, a director of a tabla ensemble who wanted to now uh, pivot to be able to create and record new music with other musicians remotely. 
all kinds of distance learning initiatives, even things like, you know, training your voice, training your instrument, uh, you know, a, con a pop and country music songwriter who uh, wanted to attend master classes, workshops and songwriting based in, ten in Nashville. Um, these are just a few examples of the kinds of things that have been supported wow. over the years. Uh, so really it's a self-directed program for people to kind of identify their own learning objectives, where they want to see, where they want to see their career, career grow and to kind of develop a program for themselves um, and to really clearly articulate what those goals are and really clearly plan them out. So I think I'm gonna leave it there uh, so that other, <laughs> others have space to speak and then I'm happy to, to pick up the thread um, as we go on. Thank you, Bushra. Um, and there's a lot to chew on there, guys. So um, we're gonna be opening it up as we said at a little later um, so that we can engage in more of a interactive discussion. Um, next up, we have uh, David Click Cox, a gentleman who I've known for years, who've been in the trenches and worked at the big labels and has seen it from both sides. And he's now running his own company called Click Creative. David, take it away, please. Yeah, I don't know what necessarily to take it away too, but is there a specific right. question you want me to address or, you know, what do you want me to share? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that we are um, uh, hoping to, to get from you guys on the panel is perhaps you can talk about what steps you've taken on an individual basis um, or an organization basis, a business basis to, um, you know, come up with some solutions at this particular point in time, because all the data that I've seen and all the stats that I've I've read seem to talk about you know how bleak the conditions are and we don't want to dwell on that but we want to inspire people by letting them know that there are individuals such as yourself and Demetrius and Courtney um, three examples here who are working in the private sector if you will um, who are making things happen making change happen so you know um, perhaps you can talk about experiences. You can talk about practical advice. Yeah, I can give some insight. I can, I can give some insight on all that. It's nice to share some space with y'all, man. Um, I know everybody here, so it's cool to see y'all. Um, also, I gotta, I gotta big it up to, to Phil um, just for for doing this. And then, second of all, um, if y'all don't know, like Phil's an, a pioneer and an OG when it comes to you know media. Um, you know, salute to you for, for Word Up. I mean, the Word magazine was, was a, you know, a major, major thing in, in Toronto. Huge. Uh, you know, huge. Like, uh, you know, even before I worked at labels, I was sending you, you know, artists that I worked with back in the 90s, like, you know, put, put us on, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I, I just want to acknowledge that, you know what I'm saying? Because, um, you know, one thing that I've been really kind of... <clears throat> recognizing over this period of time that we've all had to kind of like, I guess you could say enlightenment. <laughs> it's just that we don't really champion, especially amongst black, um, the music industry, our, our stories enough. And our, and our, and not just stories as an artist, but stories as business people, stories as, um, as a community, like, you know, who, who would lead the way, who would open up the door for the next person to come in, you know what I mean? And what successes they had done before you, you know? And, um, you know, I just, I want to acknowledge that first and, and salute to you for that, you know what I'm saying? So Thank you. Um, for me, I think, you know, it's, it's cool when you, when you talk about like not harm, you know, not like sitting and, and dwelling on, I guess, the, the challenges that we've been facing in the music business, because it can be very uh, depressing, <laughs> you know? I think, um, you know, the biggest thing these days is, is for me is, is trying to motivate the people that are in my lives, um, especially the creatives, because they're the ones that are actually having, some, some are having very challenging times of being creative in this space. And then actually some artists I've seen actually step up um, and actually have been the most creative in the last year, you know? And there's a lot, there's a lot of um, opportunities um, 
you know, for people to actually seize um, through online marketing, through, uh, you know, creating your own spaces and taking, taking advantage of the different opportunities like Bush spoke about, you know, like actually applying for grants and, and applying for opportunities that you can actually help maybe build your studio, record new material, um, you know, things of that nature. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities. It's just a matter of like shifting your perspective as they would use like the big word. Every time I go into some of these things, it's like, how are you pivoting? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you know, how are you shifting? How are you pivoting? What's your pivot mode? You know what I mean? So I think, um, for me, it's my job is really trying to help motivate the people around me and how they can pivot. You know, and at the same time, I'm trying to think even outside of myself, you know, not trying to be selfish, but it's like, you know, I'm trying to think for the, for the community at large. And so, you know, being part of organizations like Advance, um, you know, I've, I've recently became a board member of SEMA, which is the Canadian Independent Music Association. And being able just to like make sure that there's opportunities for people, you know, of color and black people, you know what I mean? So that's being kind of one of the, I guess you could say the passions of mine in the last year is like, how can I make our industry better? Even though I felt like I always did that, but I think there's a couple of things that kind of showed me that, you know, there's spaces that we're not in, there's spaces that we're not, that people aren't, aren't having access to. And if I know what those issues are, then I should step up and try to make a difference. I feel like all this shit, some shape or another, and do what we can, not everybody can do that shit. Absolutely. That's my thoughts. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and we're going to come back and, and talk about advance a little later, but um, let's uh, swing over to the CEO of Anti Skeptic Entertainment and also the man behind Mississauga Music, uh, Mr. Demetrius Nath. Perhaps you can like, um, like, click, talk about, you know, what you're doing in this moment to, um, you know, as uh, Click says, pivot and help those less fortunate. Thank, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm going to, because of the space that I'm in, maybe I'm gonna approach it from a, from a different perspective because a lot of what I do is marketing and promotion. And, and within that, I think um, there are two main challenges that I kind of see, especially from artists um, trying to find opportunity. Um, as you mentioned before, I run a little music marketing promotion uh, management company called Anti-Skeptic Entertainment. And we represent, have represented Black artists, Indigenous artists um, often. And um, I, I, th I think from an artist perspective, and maybe a lot of the people that are listening in to this right now, um, you know, you see, you see your hero or you see an artist that inspires you or you see another business that's your competition and um you want in on that space um now more so than ever because of the lack of opportunity out there and, and i think the main challenge that i see is still understanding who your audience is i think there's a huge gap between artists creating their art and their music and then being able to clearly define who is their audience. Um, once you can establish that clearly, I think um, I think it's going to be a lot easier for for you to get those opportunities. Um, from an anti-skeptic entertainment point of view, where we do PR and we do radio promotion and management and talking to labels and things like that we have to find out for our artists if if you're a right fit if you have the right product if you're at the if you're the right genre if your production value is there and um if you belong on that stage right so i know i'm sort of approaching this in a traditional marketing point of view from that kind of perspective but i think for companies like ours to be able to champion artists from the black indigenous communities and people of color um, 
that's one of the first steps that we have to work on before we can find those opportunities. And, uh, and likewise, um, you know, I have founded a not-for-profit initiative called Mississauga Music, and we produce um, Mississauga Music Week, Mississauga Music Awards, run um, the largest um, indie music festival called Rock the Coliseum in Mississauga. And um, the, the same thing applies, right? Um, for organizers of these events, does it make sense to place you in front of a certain audience? So back to understanding who the audience is for these artists is crucial. And then, and then the second thought I really have is um, sort of the challenge too is how good are you, right? And again, from a marketing and promotion point of view, but are, are you great to um, find yourself into these opportunities that maybe some of us are putting together? I personally am in a rock band called Maybe May, and there's three of us, and two of us are clearly brown. And, you know, I'll say it before, you know, anybody else, we're, you know, we're not the best band out there. We're, we're okay. You know, you listen to us. If you check out babymay.com, you're going to be like, yeah, not bad, not good. And, um, and, uh, and our numbers reflect that. Our engagement online reflects exactly that. So until our streaming numbers, until our YouTube views, until our um, fan engagement, merch sales, all of those things reflect our ability. I personally, I'm not going to expect um, grants from Ontario Arts Council and certain treatment and opportunities with Saga Music Fest um, until I'm at a place where I can go, yeah, um, not only do we qualify under people of color, but we also have the other, you know, the other aspect of this in place and, and we know our audience. So, you know, we, for the most part, try and stay in our lane. So, and, and I think if you're good, if you know your audience and if you um, have clearly defined who you are as an artist with the help of, you know, your community and, you know, and, and people like that are, that are on this panel, I think, you know, you will rise to the top and there's a lot of examples and inspirations, you know, everybody from Oscar Peterson to Drake to Billy Talent to Sum 41 where there are people of color and, you know, black artists and indigenous artists that have risen to the top. So, so I, th I think in, in summary, I think there, there are opportunities out there like I see some of these grants from Factor from Ontario Arts Council that I'm trying to like apply for, um, for Mississauga Music, for Maybe May, I think those opportunities exist. And I think, you know, the federal government, especially in Canada is doing a lot right now. There's associations out there that have just formed to kickstart, you know, the, the, the live music industry again. So I think a lot of those things are in place, but from uh, marketing, management, promotions perspective, and also being an artist of color myself, before I leap to those opportunities and, you know, how can I, you know, take advantage of these things that are at play? I think there has to be some self-reflection and um, I guess just fine tuning of who I am as an artist or as an organization. All right, thank you very much, Demetrius. And now we uh, have up next, we have uh, Courtney Uno Allen, um, Mr. Numero Uno himself, who <laughs> churches for a while and uh, has had some success doing that, Courtney. Um, I don't know which direction you want to take this conversation in. Um, well, I'm, I'm just listening to everybody talk and, and, and taking it in. And, and if you want to talk about obstacles for, 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 you know, BIPOC, whatever that word is, I know I, I, that word is very, very new to me, but yeah, if you want to talk about 
you know, black indigenous people and the obstacles and getting through the music industry or industries in general, it's, it's the love for each other first and foremost, you know, the, the, the unity, the unity of, of individual uh, collectives, like, like all these companies, right? Like I know click a long time, you know, we, we've talked on conversations, different things, different ideas, you know, when I have, you know, brainstorms, I'll call him, but like, you know, like Demetrius, I've never, I've had one, maybe one conversation prior to this, you know, it's the unity, it's the love, it's the, and this goes, from, there's so many different entities, right? Like if you go to, you know, at another city, the unity of the music scene or the entertainment scene in general is, 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 is enormous compared to uh, where we are, right? Like, that, that that will create if I think more unity in the in the in the companies and and the creatives and the producers and the the, the graphic designers and all the people involved in that want to go to this level of of success that will create more awareness for grants and and these things I don't think people even know about the opportunities that Bushro was talking about there was tons of stuff in there you know Demetrius like a lot of people don't know a lot of people don't know about clicks what click can do people don't uh, like people don't even know the really the reach his hand can go people need to know you know and that goes for many different companies there's so many people in this city even in this country that have reach that the the general population I guess you could call them or the the, the consumer doesn't know about or even the artists themselves don't know about there's so many grants I never knew about coming up. There's so much stuff. If it wasn't for my publicist at the time, Tara Muldoon, or my business partner, they're 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 diggers. They're the kind of people who look for the information. They're special people. There's people who want grants. There's people who want the the they want every string they can pull. To, they, you have to attack this beast from every angle. And a lot of people don't have the assets. They don't have the weaponry to to do to do it. They don't even know it's there. They don't know it's available. They they have no clue. And I, and you know. And from a consumer's point, I just want people to like how to like before before we became the number one city in the world to produce music. We have the number one artist in the world. We have the number one R and B artist in the world. We have some of the top. We have top ten producers in the world. That never that, before all of that energy, the that it was hard to get people to listen to your music. No matter how popular you were, my own friends wouldn't listen to me. They're so busy listening to other music, right? So the unity there, the the the, the city has grown since then. As a as a, the city has grown since then as a global entity that the world knows Toronto and Ontario and Canada has got music they've got artists they've got talent right the world knows that now so things are things are different the, the, the things are very different pivoting through 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 the music industry is like click said it's depressing like it's it's really it's all it's it's all over the place right so for me I want more consumers to know about the music more. I want them to know more about it. They don't even know it's there. They're still choosing, you know, and I hate to say American music over our music or or popular music over over the music that's local, you know, and and artists are still not united as much as they should be. And I think more unity will create more awareness, more awareness will create more attention more grab and then you know things like saga city music festival well there's more attention there's more attention to the the grants the things like that there's just i think we have we have a long way to go as a music and as a as an industry and it's you know and it's it starts with love and unity and working everybody working towards that you know when it's like it's hard not everybody can not everybody's cut for, from that cloth not everybody's willing to uh to do those things. Well, I see, I see, you know, um, you three gentlemen here, for example, um, being, you know, examples of what could come if you guys, you know, some people go golfing. I, I don't know what you do to get together network. 
um, it's, amongst... it's hard. It's hard because everybody has their own agenda, right? But if if we look at you three, for example, I see a lot of you know can do attitude here, and uh, those things should not be underestimated when you when you talk about some other cities. I think it's up to us um, to make those connections, to have those conversations, and uh, see where there's common ground. It is in a sense, it is in a sense left up to us to, to make those. And we, 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 you know, at least I go out and I, I, you know, I'm a very upfront person. I'll, I'll walk up to anybody and start a conversation and shake a hand. And, you know, I'm that guy that will do that. You know, not everybody had that. Right. So it, 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 it's hard. It's hard to find the things you want, the people you want, the links you need, the, the assets you need to, the, the strings you need to pull to get where you need to go. Right. And like, like Demetra said, there's a lot of uh, fine tuning people have to do, even myself. There's a lot of fine tuning I had to do over the years just on how to interact and how to how to move and do things. You know, a lot of people don't have those that etiquette. They don't know what how to move in a room full of artists or or they don't know who's who. They don't know. You know, it's it's a, there's lots of lots of obstacles. Lots. I, I think. Um the most revolutionary tool in my opinion um this is my opinion because i know other people don't don't necessarily agree with this it really comes down to your personal taste when it comes to social media but the app clubhouse in my opinion is probably one of the most uh revolutionizing in terms of networking and communication that can break down the barriers that we're talking about right now specifically in regards to like how do you maneuver how do you network? How do you align? If you're in the right rooms, listening to the right people that have positive things to say and aren't, as they would say, capping, um, <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot of knowledge out there. And, so much. And, and uh, it really just comes down to like, you know, are you willing to go to the well and jump in and swim? I don't even say drink. I say swim. <laughs> drown. You should say drown. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is this, you need to know how to swim because if you jump in and you don't know how to swim, then you drown. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's really what it comes down to. And I think that the knowledge and the wisdom is really at y'all, your is everybody's fingertips. Like you, you can find out so much stuff about the music business by Googling. You can find out so much stuff of just about life by Googling and by YouTube, the, all these spaces are your best friend. It's really just comes down to like, as individuals, what are you the most comfortable? Some people aren't comfortable in like being, you know, on Clubhouse talking freely, <laughs> you know what I mean, in an audio setting. Some people aren't, aren't comfortable putting a camera on and doing, you know, a different thing every 15 seconds to put up a TikTok, do you know what I mean? Some people aren't comfortable with Twitter because they don't know how to write or they're not the greatest in that space. Or some people just are visual people where they like to put up video cameras and photos on their Instagram because that's their space they live in. The thing is, there's a space for everybody. You know what I mean? There really is. And I, I you know, I, I hate to say because it, it sounds kind of negative when I use this word, but I feel like if you're not, if you're not taking advantage, those are just excuses to me. Well, you know I mean, yeah. like, like there's, there's no reason why you can't advance. Um, to a certain degree i think that there's levels right to get to like let's say a top level like you know the top of the mountaintop that is very challenging for anybody and everybody but you can get to you know at least a a, a medium space yeah. on your own means and if you can get to that medium space that's when you start to align with the people that help you to get to the next level and that alignment is very important because you can align with the wrong people that take you back down the hill or you can align with the people that take you up the hill. And, and that just comes to, to making the right choices. And some of us make bad ones and some make good ones. And that's just what it is. Now, I wanna get back to a couple of things, um, guys. Um, you know, uh, Bushra has, has uh, provided us with a lot of examples of people who have benefited from I the have. program. 
I have. <laughs> Let's talk about that for a little bit. Was we able to uh, shed some more light on some of the examples? Well, I was going to say, David, do you want to talk about your own example? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't, I, I don't think it was during like, this COVID period or anything like that, no. but in just in general, like it's like two years ago, I yeah, think. like two years ago, like you know, I heard about the the program because I knew some other people that have been in it and took advantage of the application, and I used it from a, from a standpoint of traveling because I you know needed funds to be able to go to trips to New York to LA to all these different places, and that's how I took advantage of it as an opportunity for me to like you know get in front of rooms with the right people. You know, and those things can be costly for people sometimes, you know what I mean? So it's like to be able to have that is, is, is great. And especially, you know, for me, it was targeting space. It's like, I'm not going to LA when there's nothing going on and there's no opportunity for me to meet people. Like I'm, I'm taking advantage of specific events that I know I have relationships at, that I have, you know, colleagues and friends that I know are attending that will help me with the networking that I'm trying to achieve in those marketplaces, you know what I mean? So for me, that's definitely how I used it. Um, I know for other people, they used it as a mentoring, like a couple you know, colleagues of mine, they used it in a sense of like, hey, I need to better myself in media and PR work. And I need to get my network in America better. So they actually got a mentor in America to actually align themselves to do that. You know what I mean? So there's so many different ways to take advantage of, of, you know, of the, the application with OAC. And, and it's the program supports people at any like emerging mid career and established. So I think Demetrius is right that, you know, you really have to be ready. You know, you know, you need to be in a position when you're, um, you kind of need to reflect on who you are and where you're trying to go and who you're trying to be. But then once, once you have a, a notion in the sense of that, figuring out like, what, it, what's, what do I, what's the next step? You know, like, is it, do I need to kind of connect with somebody like Click, <laughs> you know, and ask them to take me under their wing and, and then this support will allow me to kind of maybe buy their time or, but, you know, um, it's something that you can also come back to more than once. I mean, there are several people that have been supported through this program several times, right? So, um, and also the one thing I think is really important, and I have, I'd love to throw this out to anybody, but like what role that failure or making mistakes plays in one's practice? Because as somebody who's sort of kind of like middle age, like, uh, the more I realize, the more you get, the further along you go, it's like not being afraid to ask questions, not like being willing to acknowledge what you don't know, right? Like pursuing your interests. Like, so like, like reading really widely or listening really widely and trying to kind of just gain knowledge, right? But also not being afraid, like you're going to mess up, you know, and there's, a lot of times people will apply for support and then they don't get it because they really, you know, there's never enough money to fund all the good activity. And then you never hear from them again. You know, even if you try to reach out to them, right? I actually, I actually think that that's, I think there should be maybe like a, um, uh, uh, a survey done on this because I, 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 in my, what I personally believe, I think people of color, I think, you know, black people, I know for myself, black people specifically, I think that once they're turned down, there's a more likelihood that they won't apply. Again. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've come across that so much. It's, 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 be it's because they get, they get, you know, discouraged that they're not going to get it. I know I've applied for many grants and not got them. It took a lot of applications to get the one or two that I've gotten. And I actually had to go outsource to other people that I know have written grants and helped like, formulate the paperwork and the details of, 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 a, of a good presentation, I had to outsource and pay people to help me write the grant just so I could get it. You know what I mean? And it's, it's difficult. It's difficult mm -hmm. for people, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. especially new it. art, especially new artists that have yeah. zero idea of what's going on. Right? It's not yeah. just even new artists. It's like even, even like established artists are getting shut down. Right. Yeah. So I think, you know, the real, the real, uh, traits that we're talking about here that are needed when you're talking about this panel overcoming challenges like 
in the music business, period. I, I'm not even going to say music. I'm going to say entertainment. Yeah. In the entertainment business, period. You need a drive, you need perseverance, you need passion because if you had gotten out of that, you ain't going, I don't care what anybody says. If you don't have those three things, there's no way in the world you're going to go up there. Well, exactly. let me ask you this question though, Bushra. Um, we know, I've heard it too. Um, all of us here have heard you know, people who have given up after the first time, after a couple of times. You know, I also come from a sales background where I remember sticking this on my wall that, you know, most people give up after the first two phone calls um, and then walk away. But sometimes it might take the fourth or fifth call for you to actually break through. That person at the other end is gonna be like, hey, let me just get rid of this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let me just say yes and get him out of my hair. Not that you're going to be an idiot about it or anything like that. You're still trying to be, you know, professional and all of that. But I think it takes a lot of effort. And I'm also wondering, you know, and this is unfair to ask you to represent everybody else um, who are with a funding agency, but is there outreach being done to, you know, explain to people that, look, a lot of these programs are oversubscribed. And, yeah. you know, that's a reality too. Yes. And I think we need to do, obviously, to do a better job of that. I myself was an art visual artist. I applied years, many years ago, didn't get funded. And I was like, that's it. I'll never apply again. Right. And I never occurred to me that, oh yeah, I can phone and I can ask for feedback. And also I've seen people apply, like I always give the example of an artist who applied to produce a website. They didn't get funded because there were a lot more interesting, sexier things maybe at the table. They called, they sit, came in and met with me. I gave them the feedback. They reapplied. I thought their application was, was flawless. Like I didn't, it was perfect. They also didn't, they didn't get funded the second time, right? So then I didn't hear from them again the third year they applied and they were the top ranked proposal. So there is some subjectivity, right? It really depends on what else is on the table, you know, who's around the table. There's all kinds of things, but as David said, I mean, it's persistence that, that can pay off, right? Um, you know, and, and you, if you have a funding program that's 25% or 40% of the projects are funded, it's still better odds than a hell of a lot of other things, you know? So, well, you know, uh, just just a note here. I um, last week we had one of our keynote speakers, Karen Allen, who's written that book, Twitch for Musicians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was in awe of the fact that Canadians are funded for their arts programs, for their music programs. I mean, what the heck is that? I don't think anywhere <laughs> in the world does that, except for here. Um, yeah. there, there's the UK, the UK, Australia. Australia, France, France is amazing, actually, the way they treat artists, it's pretty crazy. So <laughs> yeah, there are, there are those examples, but a lot of our American uh, friends look at us and say, hey, you know, we got to go out there and hustle. We don't have a factor. We don't have an OAC. We don't have a Canada Council or an Ontario creates, you know, that sort of thing. And um, I'm, I'm of this mind nowadays to say, you know, those of us who are OGs in this game, um, you know, should probably find ways to communicate what we know um, to the next generation. And I know that Click, for example, has a great opportunity. He teaches as well, you know, but, um, there are a lot of cats out there who are not in school programs trying to learn. You know, um, there are a lot of people who don't get to speak to Demetrius about, you know, how do I prepare, you know, to launch a record, you know, and those kinds of things. So there's some gaps there that I think we need to take a look at. And um, you're right, Click, uh, a lot of folks, if they get turned down once as a Black person, they're done with it. You, you know, know I, have, I have a brother who's 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 a reggae musician, and um, they've got a great reputation with his band, and he's tried once, and he never went back. 
you know, and it's like, what are you thinking? <laughs> you know what I mean? Did you pick up the phone? Did you call? Did you try to have a meeting? You know, there are different things you can do to learn about what it was that got you rejected, you know, but, you know, the education is, is a thing and, and Google can be your best friend, as, as David has said. Now, but I, but I do, you know, I think Courtney, you were going to say something now. Are you going to say something? I was just going to add in that, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot of people like, you know, I'm like, apply for the grant, you know, the new artists that, you know, you know, they come to me with the, can you help me? Can you manage me? Can you do this? And I'm just like, well, why don't you try this first? Try that first. Cause you know, they're a little, you know, premature, I guess, for me to take on, you know what I mean? So I'm just like, try this, try that, apply for the grant. And their first response is, is I'm not going to get it. And then the fact that Bushra had talked to that gentleman and he came in the sat down and got his, got his, you know, feedback and everything and still got rejected the second time. Like, and he came back. That's, that's a perfect story of how you need to always push, 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 push. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, I just had to add to that. That it is, it is a, it's a tough one. I, I think, um, Phil, what you're talking about in terms of like having to, to definitely reach out and educate people and for OGs to really, really look out for the new generation is something that I'm seeing a lot more now than ever. Um, you know, even with like the organization advance and things like that, it's like, you know, there's been many organizations in the past, but I've never, ever felt anything like this. Like there's just so many people involved. There's way more like uh, unity. It feels like to go back to what Courtney's talking about, about unity. I think that we're in a, you know, it's unfortunate that the murder of George Floyd had brought attention to the injustices and enlighten people, but it really has enlightened people. <laughs> and it really has, uh, unfortunately, it pisses a lot of us off that it had to go to that for a door to open. But the fact is doors are opening. So we should take advantage of those doors. And the older generations, the elders, also need to make sure that the new generation who's coming into those doors are not being taken advantage of. They're guided. These opportunities are being given to them and that not the same old fuckery is still happening. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? So it's like, that's where I feel like is our, is why I step into these spaces because I, I don't want that shit to go down like that. I don't want like, you know, I've been in the industry for 30 years. I've, 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 I've struggled, I've gone through a lot of stuff to get even to, you know, the, the, the goals that I've been able to achieve, but those things weren't easy. And I, and I have to say that I had really no mentorship. I really didn't have, uh, a real like uh, 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 you know a community around me um, and I, I want to change that I want to make us feel like there's a community that people can access and connect with to actually get them through the door I think I'd say here here to that you know um, that's definitely needed and I I'm gonna go back to you again click because um, not many people, um, are fully up on what this new organization Advance is about. You said that you are a board member there. Um, can you briefly talk about what their goal and objective is with Advance? I mean, the goal and objective of Advance is really to make sure that people are retaining and succession in the music business on the business side. So I really encourage any, you know, Black people that are, are managers, label owners, publishers, Anybody who's on the business side of the industry, this is a space where we need to actually uh, uh, support and give more opportunities and let people know of things that are in the marketplace. So for example, the first thing that they did was do a job post to make sure that people know that there are jobs available. And I know actually jobs were fulfilled from advanced actually folks posting those things up and putting them on the socials, sending them emails. So it's letting people even be aware of the opportunities that exist. And then we recently launched Amplify, which is a series that I helped kind of, you know, put together is where it's all about kind of shining the light on professionals in the music business and what they've, specifically ones that have reached certain milestones that they can talk about their experiences and people can learn something from, you know? So we had Katrina Lopez, who was Sean Desmond's ma manager for a long time and comes from the East Coast. So she has a lot of difference. And we have another one being launched on the 31st with John, 
Jonathan Shamar, um, who manages Knight Lovell, who has like almost 500 million streams and it's independent from Ottawa. Do you know what I mean? So like having people that, that have their stories and challenges that can help maybe lead people in the right direction. And then there's other initiatives that we're also working on to help kind of just, like I said, um, educate, retain, give opportunities for black people in the music business. But then I guess the other, other angle to add to it is advocacy. You know, there's definitely a, you know, there needs to be a body that's actually going out on the front lines and making sure that the funding, making sure that all the different rights and, and things that are, that are being fought for for everybody, that black people are on the front lines and our voices are being heard in those rooms. Because if we're not there, then a lot of the time our, our issues aren't come up front center. So you need to have somebody who's going to be on the front lines talking about those things, you know? So like right now, there's the bill C-10 that's being talked a lot about the changing of the CRTC and all these type of things, right? So it's advanced being able to speak up and say, hey, these are the issues that we want to talk about as Black people, you know, because we can't, you know, expect every other organization to do that for us. And this is this is a, a recent development, right? So yeah, know. it started last year. I, I'm not on the board. I'm more sit on a bunch of committees, but it was created by a lot of OGs who um, you know who work at labels and, and things of that nature. So the other thing I wanted to raise um, is you know we've been talking about you know networking. Um, um, you know, uh, getting to know the, the various players in the scene, educating ourselves and all of that. You know, having said all that, I think it's also inspiring to talk about success stories as well, because, you know, as a kid growing up, you know, it was always important for me to have role models around me that made, you know, my dreams appear more realistic. You know, and, and so I wonder whether you guys can talk about success stories in terms of, you know, your world, your, you know, your realities that can give some inspiration to people who might think that, you know, this is, this is so hard. I mean, we had, again, I referred to a, a digital uh, panel that we had last week. And um, at the end of it all, you know, the panelists that we had, they were, they were amazing, they were great. Um, but some of the information seemed a little bit overwhelming, you know, uh, when we started talking about all the different things that you can do. And these people all brought different life experiences, you know, um, you know running their own businesses and, and were really helpful in terms of what they do. But is, is the answer to show these examples? Is the answer to find mentors? What, how, do we, how do we do this? Well, I, I know there's different, different spaces that are doing different models. You know, like NIA Center, which is, if none of you are familiar with NIA Center, the NIA Center is an amazing space. That, you know, has gotten a lot of financial support in the last little bit. They have an amazing mentoring, you know, setup program right now that I've actually signed up to to help mentor mentees and stuff. But, you know, I think that there's different spaces that allow for different styles of mentoring. Um, I just actually did a mentoring program with Rise, which is a organization out of Scarborough, which was really really good. I mean, it was very easy for anybody to sign up to become uh, to get mentorship, and. Um, rise helped um fund that so that i could for example take you know time out of my schedule to devote to some individuals who need some guidance you know what i mean um i know advance is creating that same type of approach as well for myself i think my mentorships were along the people that were uh, at the same level as me to a certain degree like you know my mentors were really were like ivan barry and <laughs> probably flex you know i was in a rap group that was opening up for maestro and all those guys way back in the day so it's like but i remember going to them and being like yo what do i do and i'll never forget i didn't say i don't know i'm trying to figure it out too <laughs> i was like I'm i was like you know what i mean so i i, I feel like 
you know, a lot of this trial and error. And when I started working at, at Universal, I mean, you know, Courtney can vouch for this. Like, you know, I, I made myself available to anybody. I tried to make myself available to anybody. I was out everywhere and everywhere because it just felt like there'd never been anybody who did that. You know what I'm saying? And Not from the label, people, no. And, and some people might not have, you know, maybe like me because I'm just real. Like, I'm just going to tell you if I like it, I like it. If I don't, I don't. It's not that your shit is whack. It's just, it's not meant for me. And sometimes it's hard for people to actually fathom. Do you know what I'm saying? Because they're like, well, dude, like, what do you mean? Like, you know, and, um, you know, funny enough, actually, like, sometimes it takes multiple times. <laughs> Who said it? I think did Courtney say it or Maybe it was you, Bill, said so something about like, it takes like three or four times before you connect with somebody. Yes. I really truly have learned that and believe that like, that's how people build relationships. Like, you know, you don't get to know your partner in life after one meeting. Like you, you have to kind of meet people over and over again and explore the different sides of them for you to actually say, hey, I like this person. I want to hang out. <laughs> more do you know what i'm saying <laughs> and it's like you know i think courtney and me like i remember you know i'll just be on it like but i think courtney's the first person one of the first people to bring me rich kids music and at the time i didn't think it was like like at the level it needed to be at but courtney was very persistent and kept <laughs> coming back and kept coming back and i was like okay i get to know this person but also what helped is that he didn't just work me he worked a lot, like he hustled his way on a lot of people's doors to the point oh. where other people were coming to me and say, yo, you heard of this rich kid guy? Oh yeah, what's his name told me about that? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it, it comes in a world, in a, in a roundabout way. And you that's kind of how, it, that will never change. I think like that's the art of like, you know, Dramita, uh, you could you could speak about this as a marketer. Like, like you, you can't tell me like it's almost an anomaly for you to walk in a door and get people on board right away. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, the cliche saying of it's about who you know, as opposed to what you know, but I mean, to take that further, like you were just talking about with Courtney, um, it's why people know you or how people know you, right? Um, how did they find out about you? Um, have you accomplished something or from a referral from a friend or did you come across this person online? So the, the art of, you know, networking and relationship building in one is, is crucial, right? I mean, I, I am a fan when it comes to, you know, this, I guess, resources for artists. I'm a fan of the schools, you know, I mean, you teach at Metalworks. I, um, I teach at Harris Institute and Centennial College. There's, you know, Coalitions, Music Incubator, um, there's Trebus, you know, there's a bunch of those. And, and I think if you're serious about, you know, getting into music and the music business and eventually making a living from it, then, you know, invest that year or two and, you know, get an education. And I mean, if you can't, if you're not in a place in life where you can do that, there are these panels, right? Canadian Music Week does it, Indie Week does it, you guys are doing it, Mississauga Music is gonna do it, I'm sure North by Northeast is gonna do it. I mean, I definitely copy and pasted Bushra's email address and phone number and put <laughs> it on my notes, right? So you meet people and you know, I, I mean, who knows who you'll run into at Canadian Music Week? Like I've done that as a professional and at, when I was in school. So just try and meet people and-, and Consistently. You know, yeah, consistently. consistently. And like, That's what absolutely. I did. That's what I did. I would uh, back in the day, you know, before I had any kind of financial assets to to market myself. It was marker, CD, the name, the phone number. I couldn't get into the clubs. Maybe Click was in, or certain people, industry parties, or whatever. I would wait outside. I remember meeting Rochester like that. I met a lot of people because I knew they were inside, and I was not leaving until. I got to speak to that person or at least got to hand him my CD or that person or something. I had to be, I went, I would go downtown. I live, I'm from the West. And as you know, I go downtown just to be outside, just to stand outside at Canadian music week because I couldn't get in there or maybe I didn't have a pass or whatever it was. Like I was that persistent. Like that's just how it is. You know, I need you to, you know, I need you to see my name like 
the McDonald's sign every quarter mile. Like I need that consistency. Yeah. That's it. Right? Yeah. I like to, I like to uh, use the acronym of CPR sort of as like my personal, like cheesy lifeline consistency, persistency, and relevancy, you know, like mm -hmm. you were saying, you have to be consistent with what you're doing. Don't just be a flash in the pan and, you know, go all out for six months and a year and then disappear for the next three. People are not going to remember you. Like you have to stay around and then persistent, right? Like, like you said, um, Phil, you know, and, and, and I see this with radio all the time. Um, that first, second email, no, nobody's going to respond. But by the second month, when they've seen 10 emails from you once every week and a voicemail, they are going to crack. As long I used as to get, I used to get so upset. I used yeah. to get so mad. I click will tell you, I'd be like, why aren't they picking my music? Why aren't they playing my stuff? I would get so upset and just blast email, 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 knock, 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 call, 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 text, 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 no matter yeah. what. I'm just. Yeah, I mean, as, as long as, you know, you're not spamming or annoying them and doing it professionally, um, people will pay attention and they will respond one way or another. And, and mm -hmm. then last of all, I think with, you know, CPR, like relevancy, like are you giving the right thing to the right person? So whatever CD you're handing, don't just hand them out because there's people in front of you. Give it to the right people. Is it relevant for their world? Yeah, um, handpicked. Yeah, like be very targeted when you're building these relationships and when you're, you know, it's better to be specific in your target than cast a large net and hope that, you know, one or two out of that hundred will respond. Go after the 10 people and go after them hard. All right. Now, um, before I come back to Bushra, I'm just going to let everybody know that um, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, do so in the uh, chat and uh, I will pass it on. Um, but Bushra, I wanted to get back to you and ask you, um, were there any other, um, you know, words of wisdom or nuggets you wanted to share with us in terms of the funding process um, at OEC? Yeah, I think one thing that artists don't necessarily know uh, who are newer to the process is that it's peer assessed for the most part. So it's other artists just like yourself who are making the funding decision. So you might be applying to a deadline, say to music recording or something like that. And then you have a, you know, a program officer who is reading all that stuff and going, okay, there's a lot of hip hop in here and there's a lot of this and there's a lot of that. And they're putting together a panel of five or six people who might have expertise in these different musical styles, right? But it's another artist just like yourself that's making the decision, right? And so I often will say to people like, kind of write to yourself, right? Because other artists know the costs of things. They know what it costs to rent studios and they know what it costs to do stuff. And so you're speaking to your peers, right? And so you want to talk about, you just want to be yourself. You want to be, use your own authentic voice. You know, sometimes you see people speaking in the third person or they're, or they might be thinking that they're speaking to a, a bureaucrat, but actually you're speaking to another artist. So if you're a humor, you know, if you're a wisecracker or whatever, then feel free to be like that, right? Like feel free to share whatever you feel comfortable sharing. I think that there's also some generational things that I see because everything is so much in, oriented to social media now. So sometimes people feel, you know, people are so used to exposing themselves, right? Um, but you don't necessarily have to do that. You need to, you should share what you feel is relevant. Um, you should try to answer the questions. Um, you know, there's those writing tips that kind of try to help to guide you in terms of what is being asked of you. But I would often say that simply we want to know who you are and then more practically what it is that you want to do, right? You need to shine through your and then, application. Yeah. And how are you going to go about doing it? So like, what is the story that you're trying to tell overall, right? Um, am I making sense? <laughs> yeah, for sure. I would, one of the things that I, I, I coach people on when it comes to the grants is like, basically all the art um, foundations, so Ontario Art <laughs> uh, Council, Canada Council of the Arts, 
Toronto Arts Council. All those applications, foundations, are all jury-based for the most part. They're all jury-based. And so their uh, individuals are coming through and want to hear actually more the artistic approach of things. They really want to hear by the person's first voice of what it is they're trying to achieve in a very non-selling marketing way. Yes, it's about your independent voice as an artist and what you're going to do with it afewards is a whole other thing, but it's exactly. like what it, yeah, what's the story? And, what's your story? And so when I work with my artists, I never do those applications. Mm -hmm. I might help them with a couple of things, but all the questions that are in those applications have to come from the artist's voice. I never come in and say, hey, let me do your application for you because that's not how you do those applications. Now, factor is a totally different thing. Ontario Art, Ontario Media Fund is a totally different thing. Like all these different spaces are a lot more business orientated. And, and I think, you know, factor for my, in my opinion, needs to make some changes in how they're, uh, um, I guess you could say uh, reviewing their applications and who's getting through. But, um, you know, that, that's just from my experiences of, of applying for grants and, and getting them. This is, this is a great segue for me to um, remind those uh, listening to this conversation that tomorrow we do have a funding panel and uh, we'll have representation from Factor. We'll have representation from Ontario Creates We'll have representation from um, uh, the city of Mississauga. And uh, I know I'm missing another one. You're going to have uh, Dwayne Dixon, who is the Dwayne inter Dixon. Dwayne intermusic Dixon officer is at OAC. So, um. Dwayne Dixon is a new Jack at uh, Ontario Arts Council. And uh, he's been out there in the trenches for many years. He has worked with um, Nia. And uh, he's also manifesto, manifesto as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I see th these efforts on the part of the funders as long overdue measures, you know, to reflect the population that that are taxpayers. You know, uh, make sure that there's equity and 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 you know relevancy um, to the programs and, and make sure that we do have, you know, some, some ways of when you're being assessed, and this was my experience for many years, you're being assessed by a jury of your peers. And by that, I mean, um, there's been instances in some funding programs where none of the, uh, the jury members live in Toronto, you know, and appreciate the music scene in Toronto that I was reflecting, whether it was a Toronto Urban Music Festival or, you know, the Irie Music Festival, that sort of thing. These things now, it seems to me, are now being addressed. Uh, you have Canada Council, um, you have um, Department of uh, Canadian Heritage that realize that in this moment, you know, that they need to make some changes as well that better reflects the population that they're serving. And um, whether the advocacy comes from advance or whether the advocacy comes from Mississauga Music, you know, or, you know, our own um, Saga City Music Festival as well as individuals, I think we also need to know that it's okay to advocate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, there's no harm in, you know, collectively sitting down and saying to an officer, look, here are some of our concerns, you know, and, and having those concerns addressed and looked at, you know what I mean? So um, money is tight these days. Please come back tomorrow, 2 to 3.30. Um, we're going to have um, the funding panel and... Um, you know, there'd be lots of gems and, and great ideas, hopefully, that comes out of that to assist um, those who, you know, are trying to get some money to get going, you know. Um, I remember um, Bushra and I talked about, you know, the difficulty these days that artists are facing. And, you know, I'm hoping for the day, you know, possibly in the next election, for example, when we will begin to talk about universal basic income, you know, where artists aren't left to survive by their wits, 
Um, but if they can be by their peers judged to be professional artists, you know, that they should be funded, they should be supported. You know, um, they create art, not just for, as you said, click for the sake of commerce, but art has a way of bringing people together, empowering people, making positive change in the community. And I'd love to be a part of any group that is willing to advocate for those things because yes, as I believe Courtney said, we have the number one and two artists in the world in, in terms of Drake and The Weeknd. Um, and it was a shame to see the Grammy just ice uh, The Weeknd just recently, you know, when it was clear that he had a record that was there. I can't, your microphone, I can't hear your mic, Courtney. Sorry, I said one and one. Don't don't get me in trouble calling anybody number two. I said number uh -huh. one R and B artist, <laughs> number one rap artist. That's right. what I said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for correcting that. Don't I, get me in trouble. I, I stand corrected, <laughs> but you know, um, before you guys go, can you tell me about a success story that hopefully inspires the folks that are tuned in here today? I know Click, you manage a lot, a lot of artists. Courtney, you've had some success. I know you mentioned Rich Kid. And uh, Demetrius, you've worked with a lot of success stories as well. Can you guys share with us some of those successes? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a cool one that might, um, that might make sense. Not in, not because he's a person of color or black or indigenous. He's actually a white country boy. Okay, and it might not be relevant, but there's a point to this story. I promise. So, I saw this guy at an open mic at Boston Pizza, I believe, at Square One, about four years ago for this like contest. And he did well, and I was one of the judges for this open mic contest. And, um, and I told him, you have a voice for radio. Like his singing style was very much like a country artist you'd hear on the radio. Anyway, fast forward, a year, year and a half, and I think about three years ago, he decided that he was, he was, he was a musician in a band when he was in his younger, you know, his late teens, early twenties. But, you know, since then he's, you know, had a, had a, had a different lifestyle and job. And anyway, he decided he was going to be a country artist. And so um, he moved back to his parents, like in his mid thirties, I believe, and um, started spending his entire life savings on going to Nashville, recording with the right guys, putting together a country, you know, getting all the pieces together, the pictures, the band, all of them paid, all this kind of stuff. And um, he had some great songs. And we met at Second Cup at, you know, Square One again and told him how radio works and all that kind of stuff. And, and this guy is, is actually phenomenal because of his work ethic. You know, he'll tell you that his voice isn't standout. Um, everybody at Country Radio says his voice isn't a standout, you know, like recognizable voice. His songs aren't life-changing. There's solid country songs, but they aren't life-changing songs that you'll probably remember so far, right? But um, this guy worked independently every facet of the music industry that I've seen worked from the playlists to, um, to the labels, to his social media, to bugging the festivals around Ontario to get him on stage. He entered all the contests like obsessively. Okay. Like it's a personality type. That's not for everybody, but he knew what he wanted to achieve and he, went hard and um and then within the span of two and a half years three years he is now you know he's he had like five top 100 radio singles he won a bunch of contests including a big one which was um the boots and hearts emerging artist contest and this guy as of this week his first single on warner is top 20 at canadian country radio and it's to see that sort of a rise so fast from somebody that wasn't technically an artist, you know, three years ago, to make that much noise and dedicate 
every single day, you know, bugging people and, you know, just, it's, it's truly, truly inspirational to me. Like you hear these stories and it's, it's good, but like, I just saw all of this unfold in the last three years. So I'm just very impressed. Uh, and, and just, it just goes to show that really doesn't matter. Like if it's a story from the seventies, eighties or from today, like if you put in the work and if you're motivated and passionate and you know where you want to go, um, you can do it. Yeah. Talent is important. And, you know, uh, the contacts are important, but it's the work ethic and his determination that really superseded all of the other things. Okay. So David Boyd James. All right. Um, yeah. Click, I know you've had some successes. I know your wife, she's, she's a successful artist. Do you want to talk about um, your success as... A... Um, you know, my successes, I think, are more even for my own personal stuff, like just being able to do a round table discussions around breaking down racial barriers, which Peripheral was part of and, and 60 other individuals across the country were a part of. To me, that's a huge success. Like to get the, the, um, the voices and the emails and the conversations I've had from major presidents of major companies and organizations to pay attention to the uh, the equity issues that happen in our in our in our in this marketplace is a huge thing, and I think that's super successful. And I I'm looking forward to you know we're almost done this report um, that's going to come from those from those sessions, and uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to what's going to come from that. Um, uh, I'm also um, you know, when I think about other artists, just like people that I've been watching or people that I've discovered in the last, you know, little bit in looking at artists and how they've been able to, I guess you could say, um, pivot <laughs> in this in this in this time. You know, Savannah Ray. You know, I think she put out a great record, R and B soul artist, who you know I know has had some challenges um, with the COVID and and not being able to be out there. Um, even Challenge is trying to get her own record company to do what they want to do. And, and like, you know, that's not always an easy thing. And um, I think she's done a great job at kind of, you know, what I believe is the most important thing in today's market is, is build a community, you know, okay. like build a community around what they're doing and what they're about. Another artist I'll tell you guys to check out is somebody called uh, um, X Miranda. Mm -hmm. um, she's an artist that came on the TikTok literally a year ago and has over a million likes, almost 100,000 followers. And she's just a religious person, religiously putting stuff up on TikTok. And I just, I noticed how that model really can work. And it's just about finding the right song. I think she's like, you know, missing that song is really going to propel her to the next level. But once that comes, she's helped made a community around what she created and that's what it takes to like getting to that next level yeah she was one of the examples i gave actually i didn't name her but uh got that skills and career development grant to work on her songwriting on her voice you know do some one-on-one -on -one mentorship so yeah. awesome mm -hmm. and uh courtney i know um i've associated you with rich kid for years and years and you've had some successes with rich kid but is there anyone in particular you want to talk about? Well, as of late, I've been working with a bunch of artists. There's some doing marketing with uh, 2306 is a company that I work for. for uh, they're based out of America. And we, uh, what we do is bridge the gap. And I think we spoke about this before, that uh, we bridge the gap between artists that are world renowned and not known in North America. Because... There's so many people in like, say, Africa, right? And that's where our focus is right now because Afro soul and Afro beats and that music right now to me is, is that's what I'm mostly listening to. Guys like Dandy Lisbon, he's uh, one of the artists we market. He's huge in, uh, in, in, in Europe and uh, in Africa. And he's a, he, he's a huge DJ. Uh, DJ D. Rivaldo, another DJ, house DJ from Africa, from Portugal, actually that uh, we work with, um, there's a lot. There's a lot of artists that we do. And we just, what we do is try to bridge the gap. We try to bring their music here and help them market themselves here. 
you know what I mean? And uh, in but uh, my primary artist, his name is uh, Brazy Roberts, and he's uh, yeah, the artists who know him, the people who know him. He's very uh, he's versatile. He's nothing he can't do. He's he was an actor. He came out of acting. He's been in a couple of big uh, motion pictures, and uh, he wanted to depart into music. And we've been working together for the last for five years now and now uh, we just started releasing music and and like click said creating a community is hard it's hard for me it's hard to create a community right now especially in covid and the fact that i'm canadian and my artist is american and the artists that i work with are european or portuguese or african it's hard to create a community on social network with uh so much going on so it's it's important to to, to do that I wanted to re reiterate that but uh, yeah Brazy Roberts is the artist that I've been focusing on and working with okay and, and, and Bush for any final words of encouragement I think uh, keep on keeping on do what you know do the work uh, do. you know do the work that you can do be confident in yourself and not um, in, in, in what it, your own practice you know and try not to kind of follow, you know, uh, I think it's, as I said earlier, I think it's important to kind of like listen to as much music as you can, read as much as you can and pursue all of your interests, but really to kind of try to know about what your own style is, you know, figure out what that is and kind of try to protect that, you know, um, because sometimes it takes the world time to catch up with you, you know, and, and with black artists and, artists of color and the music that's being made. And uh, yeah, just keep asking questions and you know, you're gonna make mistakes, but that's just part of life and, and uh, do your best and try to be, I think the most important thing is be kind to yourself and kind to others. Thank you very much. That sounds too. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. This is all great advice. And um, we're coming up to 3.30 right now. So let me thank you all, David, uh, Demetrius, Bushra, and Courtney. You guys were amazing. And uh, the comments that I'm looking at here, um, one reads, thank you so much for your knowledge and time today. So I think that's well spoken. And uh, I just want to echo that. And I hope we get a chance to do this again. So on behalf of everybody here, we would like to thank you. And I also want to thank our sponsors, Factor, uh, Canadian Heritage, the Irie Music Festival, and all those who have tuned into this. By the way, we are going to post this um, on the website for those who perhaps want to go back and listen to all the great advice that you guys have. So it'll be there for you to see it on demand. So thanks again. Have a great day. Stay safe. And uh, we will talk soon. Take care. Yes. Thank you. Bless. Check your emails, guys. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.